Today I'd like to take this uh, chance to talk to you about my own area of research in terms of automobility and how it relates to uh, the pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and the COVID-19 uh, illness which is associated with it. And, um, and to perhaps also to reflect more generally about uh, how we as academics deal with this sort of event. And uh, I think one of the interesting things for me that's already come out of, of this situation is that uh, social science has a lot to say about uh, what is apparently uh, more of a hard science event. Uh, and we have a lot to contribute. And, and I hope that this uh, discussion around automobility is something of an illustration of uh, the sort of things that we can think about, do and participate in. Uh, to help societies and to help uh, everybody to, to deal with the whole pandemic situation. Um, my background is uh, very much in, involved in the automotive industry, I should say um, quite clearly at the start. Uh, I'm not an apologist for the industry, uh, I'm not a lobbyist for the industry, um, but I'm someone who's spent more than 30 years now um, researching looking at how this industry works, particularly from uh, the aspect of sustainability, um, but also in terms of things like strategy, uh, economic structure, government policy, regulation, uh, and many other aspects, uh, which collectively define what automobility is. Uh, so today I'm going to talk around um, this theoretical framework of socio-technical systems. Um, which I expect many of you will know, some of you may not. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on the detail of that research, but I'll sketch out how it works um, and how it applies in my particular area of, of work in terms of the automotive industry. And then I'm going to think a bit about um, what's happened with the arrival of this pandemic and, and how in my area of research in automobility, um, that's changed that world in, in all sorts of important ways and, and what's likely or possible to emerge in the future. So it's partly about how we think about this, this issue and it's partly about how we apply that thinking to a specific case, um, which could also be applied in others. I'm, for example, you know, I'm currently working with a small team where one of the other guys is, is involved in food, food research and, and food issues. So our study will look at both automotive and food as two areas, two kind of domains uh, of, of significance, which um, have been differently influenced and sometimes similarly influenced by the pandemic. And um, just as a little head, heads up about that, uh, one of the kind of similar findings is that there's been a, something of a back to the future moment uh, wherein people have rediscovered life in the 1950s, more or less. <laughs> um, which is to say, you know, we, we've rediscovered that you don't have to drive everywhere. We've rediscovered that you can make your own dinner, you can cook your own food. Um, so things like that are very interesting in the way that society has changed. So I'm going to talk a bit about this area of socio-technical systems research. Uh, basically, it's, it's a very live, active area of research, um, and it pulls in lots of different disciplines. Um, it has a range of antecedent theoretical roots, shall we say. Some of it to do with understanding how economies change over time, some of it to do with how technologies make such a big difference to our lives and how, they, how technologies permeate society and how society and technologies interact. Um, and we've seen that in many areas of life, most obviously, of course, with the internet. Um, but it also sp spreads its area of interest into things like understanding how organizations and institutions act, you know, how, how we become embedded into ways of life, how our lifestyles are created. So we think of these socio-technical systems as, as broadly speaking, dynamic, changing, but still more or less intact and coherent uh, inter interactions. The, the, the boundaries of any socio-technical system are fluid, shall we say, or at least a bit ambiguous. We can define them in different ways, but the idea is that we see this as a broadly coherent entity and try to understand how the entity changes over time from the myriad influences that act upon it. And you know, if you take that basic idea and then you apply it into automobility, uh, you can see that you know, the, the car is, is the kind of fulcrum technology. It, it's the piece of hard artifact that forms the core of this whole socio-technical system. And uh, by having the car in that place, then around it is the industry that makes that car and around that is the support infrastructure that makes the use of cars possible. And that support infrastructure then becomes very wide. You know, you've got obviously service garages, uh, dealerships and so forth. 
but you've also got a much bigger infrastructure, not only in things of like fuel and so forth, but the insurance industry, the finance industry, um, the way in which we start to structure our lives around the possibilities of the car. And of course, this has been going on for well, over 100 years now. And it's become quite a settled form. Uh, of course, there is change. Companies come and go. Cars have changed over time. But broadly speaking, what we've seen is a growing and growing and growing level of automobility. Uh, you know, when I was a child, tragically a long time ago now, but <laughs> when I was a child, you know, maybe um, UK had around three to four million cars in the late 1950s, whereas now there's upwards of 30 million. So the embeddedness of, of the automobile in our society has become more and more profound. Um, and that comes with a kind of cultural and social acceptance, sometimes in, in slightly bizarre ways. You know, we, we have come to accept, for example, that people can park their cars on the pavement. Um, but also around it, it becomes um, all sorts of interest groups, powerful in, in interest groups, companies, government departments, local authorities. Now, local authorities make a, a lot of money out of car parking, for example. So these all act to keep reinforcing and reinventing the importance of the car. And before the COVID emerged, this was an industry and an area of activity that was really undergoing quite rapid change, um, despite having had a long period of relative stability. And those changes were, were essentially tied in with um, the problems of living with such a massive car population um, and, and the, the diseconomies of automobility. So there was a growing interest in, in reducing carbon emissions and in, in reducing air pollution, for example, uh, reducing death and injuries from cars, of which there's globally more than a million per annum. And, and that's leading to things like micromobility, the interest in autonomous cars, but it's also leading to industrial restructuring, uh, the changing spatial structure of the industry. And of course, that for us in the UK is, is tied in with things like uh, the decision to leave the European Union. So it wasn't exactly a static situation. There were things going on. Um, there were changes happening, um, but they weren't necessarily happening particularly quickly. Um, and in many respects, I think uh, this was a process of change that was still being largely contained and managed by the automotive industry and by the wider kind of interest groups of automobility. So here's how I kind of think about it um, for myself when I'm talking to industry and government people and the like. Um, so what, what we have in the middle here is kind of where the industry is going in terms of the product. But we're, we're, we're moving this, this industry is moving towards these connected, autonomous, shared electric vehicles. That's broadly the, the future. Um, and, and to drive that future, we have these different areas of activity. You know, we're, new manufacturing systems, for example, uh, new architectures and, and designs in terms of the vehicles, um, but also in society, the way in which we use these cars and, and, and our kind of, uh, functional interaction with them is changing as well. Uh, so new ways of owning, new ways of sharing. Um, and in that kind of melee, in, in that very more uh, loose arrangement, we have, I see the possibility of new entrants coming in. Of course, the, the headline grabbers like Tesla are, are part of that. But perhaps more importantly, we've got um, high technology companies coming in, like Google, Apple, people like that, uh, all sorts of other new entrants who are themselves very well resourced. You know, th these are not small entrepreneurial startups, start of cash. These are giant corporations with an interest in a new market. Uh, and so they're bringing these new materials, they're bringing software, they're bringing new ways of thinking about how revenues are raised and so on. So the industry was under change before the pandemic. And you know, with that um, socio-technical perspective, it comes this idea that whilst you've got an automobility system, that the cohesive clump that I've talked about, you have other systems. And those other systems used to be separate, but now some of them are coming together. Uh, the most obvious one perhaps is, is the relationship between the electricity, you know, energy and supply industry and automotive. So historically separate, but now coming together, coming together. And, 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 the, and the way that works is quite interesting you know, because it means that there's, there's all of a sudden a shared interest, a kind of shared destiny, shall we say, between these two different sectors. So, we can see, for example, that as the electricity industry moves further and further into the use of renewables, 
So the automotive industry coming in from the other side wants to use more electricity, is developing battery electric vehicles, and those batteries can be used either on or off the car to help stabilize the grid, shaving off peak uh, supply, shaving off peak demand, smoothing the whole structure, making electricity supply uh, more viable in a high renewable context. So interesting, you know, you see that uh, in, a, in a way that migration means that some, a company like Tesla, for example, of course, they make cars, but they do other things as well. And they've often presented themselves as a, as a business that is essentially an energy business. Some of that energy is on wheels, but not all of it. So um, it, it's, you can get a sense of this is uh, an industry under significant change or potentially under significant change before the pandemic hit. And uh, this is just one of many diagrams or pictures you may see of this virus, a rather cute looking thing, I've always thought. Um, the virus emerges and, and the world changes. And I think one of the first things to say about that is that um, this is very much a crisis. Uh, and historically, you know, we in the automotive world and, and perhaps in many people in many other worlds have talked about the climate crisis, but these are very different sorts of crises. Um, in the case of this pandemic, of course, it's emerged uh, very, very quickly. It's spread very rapidly. It, it, it's of, a, of a, an order of magnitude greater than something we faced before. Um, unless you want to go back to the Black Death or the Spanish flu after the First World War. It, it, it's been severe. It's been a rapid rate of change. And there's been a high level of uncertainty. We've not fully understood what this virus is about. Um, there's been a lot of this kind of fake news and, and, and um, partial news around. So it's been extremely um, difficult for individuals to get a real sense of what's going on here. Um, and it's also been highly uneven. Different people have been affected in different ways. Some are more vulnerable than others. Some locations are more vulnerable than others. Um, I'm just back from Brazil and, and there, you know, there, there's, it was a very, very difficult situation um, and still is. Uh, and particularly for the poorer people uh, living um, in the favelas without proper access to hospitals and so forth. So all of this makes the, the, the virus, the pandemic, uh, more difficult to deal with. It's not a simple, straightforward, uh, singular event in that sense. It's permeated in many, many different ways. And um, yeah, this slide is spent in, in a sense meant to uh, just kind of capture that. Um, and, and, and we as a society here in the UK have, have kind of faced this fundamental dile dilemma. Um, how far can we continue to go out and enjoy our lives as we have been? Or how far do we have to make significant changes, particularly around the importance of um, areas like, like children's schooling? You know, can we sacrifice one area in order to obtain another? Um, and that's led to this really kind of chaotic policy environment. And it, it's not just here. Uh, I mean, you know, we're not fantastic, we're, we're not the worst, uh, but it's been a very chaotic policy environment. And, and so the things that we've been allowed to do or not allowed to do have changed. Uh, you know, the, the, the boundaries of one type of regime or another have changed. And there's been sudden direction changes in terms of policy. Um, and, and, and that's made life very difficult for everybody individually, but it's also meant that uh, at a more kind of macro level, there's a high level of uncertainty and that permeates into all aspects of life. And in my case, for example, looking at what's happened to transport and mobility, there's been this rather confusing picture. First of all, everyone's told to stay away and stay home and not go to work, protect the NHS, don't use public transport. Then, couple of months later, please come back, please get on that public transport, please use those offices, please go and buy a sandwich in Proto Mange. Then after a couple of weeks of that, sudden reversal again. Go away, don't use public transport, don't worry about eating out, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that, that makes for a very um, confusing situation, but it impacts, it makes an impact on the viability of our mobility choices. And of course, it echoes into uh, the world of automobility and its relationship with other travel modes. So uh, I think, um, you know, when we reflect on this and, and we try to understand this in real time, I think many academics find this a challenge, you know, particularly the real time element. Uh, essentially, a lot of academic research, in effect, is historical. You know, we, we look. We, we collect data, we reflect upon it, and we write about it, and then we report it. Um, 
uh, this has been different because we, we've had to gather data as it occurs, more or less. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to be quicker. We've got to move with the changing context. Uh, with previous crises, um, there have been plenty, of course, of varying magnitudes and so on. But I've picked out a couple of the First World War and Second World War. Um, you know, we've seen that there have been major social changes. Um, partly deliberate, partly accidental. You know, after the First World War, for example, where, where there's clearly a shortage of manpower, literally manpower. Um, and, and that forced all sorts of social changes in the structure of uh, agricultural labor forces and so forth, but also meant that David Lloyd George introduced this idea of homes fit for heroes. So there's a fundamental idea. I think it's quite an important one that we make those social sacrifices, but we expect some sort of comeback later, some sort of uh, response or reward for those sacrifices. Similarly, beverage report, middle of the Second World War, anticipating what's going to happen afterwards, and then saying, look, we've got to do something to, to respond to the, the, the deprivations that war has brought. Um, and, and we've got to respond to the fact that in, in that kind of crisis situation, everybody has to muck in. We are much more a society than you know, kind of Thatcherite individuals. Uh, and so I think in that, that idea, we see the emergence of you know, public education, public health and so on, emerging after 1945. Um, now, we don't know what will come out of the situation here. You know, we don't know for sure, but we're beginning to see some interesting signs that there's a willingness to embrace the idea that we, we need to be uh, rewarding society for, for, the, for the sacrifices we have made, but also interesting enough and perhaps differently, I see signs that we need to do something about rewarding the environment, you know, that, that we've, um, we've, the pandemic gave us an opportunity to see how our actions were quite clearly affecting the environment and perhaps it's given people a stronger sense of the need to make changes to protect our broader environment. So, I've been kind of thinking about some of these issues anyway, um, ahead of the pandemic hitting and um, quite early on uh, put together papers and colleagues from the business school uh, thinking about well how are we going to kind of frame this how are we going to think about this particularly in, in a kind of socio-technical sense um, so what i've done here is have a, a very broad brace based uh, sense of the kind of responses that could happen at a kind of national level uh, and, and i've distinguished between having a kind of strong or weak markets and businesses on one side and then on the other side strong or weak governance, regulation, and uh, state intervention. Um, and so, of course, this is a, a, a somewhat arbitrary framing, but I think it's just a way of trying to capture uh, and highlight the potential differences in outcome, depending on which way we try to travel. Um, and if, if business was still strong, uh, and businesses generally were still making money and, and uh, the investment was still strong and so forth, then the business as usual scenario emerges and, and um, you know, government is not particularly interventionist, it's just facilitating. Um, and that's the kind of return to normal discourse. Uh, I think as time goes by, that's less and less likely. On the other side, we have this idea of managed transition. So here you need to have a, a pretty robust economy, but at the same time, with strong guidance, then you can look towards creating a world deliberately with very strong intervention in order to achieve almost business as usual, but with a much greener, much more uh, responsible uh, flavor to it. And for me, this kind of managed transition sense is really very much what the European Union is trying to achieve in its green growth strategy, which is, of course, predated. The, the pandemic, but the pandemic has very much, um, I think, legitimized and, and strengthened their ability to pursue that route. On the other hand, we've got um, what happens when the economy is weak and you know, business is collapsing and, and markets are collapsing and inflation is running, there's austerity and so forth. And here we have, again, two alternatives. And, and again, they can both, you know, they're both positive and negative in a sense. I think the most dangerous scenario is this chaotic transition where you know, government doesn't have, have the legitimacy anymore, it doesn't have the resources, business doesn't have much resources. We see very chaotic, uneven uh, outcomes, which will be difficult to predict, but it'll be likely to be also difficult to live with. On the other side, I think we have a, this concept of managed degrowth. Uh, 
the degrowth concept has been around for, for a few years now. Uh, and again, I think the pandemic has opened the possibility uh, of people thinking, yeah, you know what, that's maybe not a bad idea. And interestingly enough, you know, the, the, the commissioner for future generations here in Wales has started talking about the need to reduce the working week um, as a response to the current conditions. And in a way, that's the starting point of managed degrowth. So it's not so fanciful as would first perhaps appear. So what do we have? Um, so then I'm starting thinking, you know, we've got this kind of big picture of the possible outcomes. And how does that really work in, in terms of the transitions? Well, here I've got a diagram which attempts to kind of capture some of that. We've got on the left hand side of the diagram, um, the existing socio-technical system just moving along and then it hits this crisis. Now, I, in most cases, and I think definitely the case in automotive, pretty certain it's the case in food, probably in others, there was a collection of potential new ways of doing things. They've been there, they're, they're, they're small, they're kind of in, in the background, they're not a dominant part of the picture, but they've been there, they're part of that picture. Um, just in a sense, sort of like seeds in the ground waiting to come out. There's also been a whole bunch of people interested in, in redefining what automobility is about in my world, in other worlds, redefining other areas of activity. Again, waiting in the wings, waiting for that opportunity almost. Um, and we've got those other socio-technical systems coming in. So you have this kind of crisis event. And then what happens? Well, many things start to happen. Um, I've, I've kind of just listed a few that, that could act to kind of destabilize this structure. The structure starts to break up because of these new pressures, because of the collapse in markets, because of the emergence of alternatives. Um, and that creates a much more fluid and dynamic situation. So, you know, in, in the world of mobility, uh, we saw it straight away, you know, I mean, one of the key elements of this was that mobility was absolutely fundamental to the spread of this virus. And then equally, restricting mobility was fundamental to trying to contain it. So the spotlight in that sense very quickly came on this issue of how we travel, why we travel, what are the consequences of us travel. Um, and in some cases, between the US, as you're probably aware, you know, this, this was an overt conflict. This is uh, between freedom and restriction. Freedom of movement, was, and freedom of, of mobility, it was very, seen, very much seen as a fundamental right uh, individual right, of course, against the interests of society as a whole, which might have been about restricting that movement and, con and containing it in the interest of society. So we see that rapidly these things become part of the political debate uh, in, the, in the US, symbolized, of course, by, by mask wearing or not. Um, but something that we haven't talked much about, I think, in the West is how successful China was in controlling its own pandemic situation. Um, given to, you know, given that, you know, of course, they were there to experience the first emergence of the pandemic and, and had very little to go on. Uh, it is extremely impressive how they have managed as a country to control the pandemic. Of course, it's hard with the data. I appreciate that we can't always be sure what's going on. But are we prepared to take those kind of measures? For example, Anybody flying back into China from anywhere else in the world has to go and pay themselves into a two week quarantine in a hotel. They are put in a room, their food is delivered three times a day, they are not allowed out. It, it's a tough regime. Everybody has it in they go, controlled. And are we prepared to live like that? I think one of the issues we face uh, you know, in societies elsewhere is, is how do we balance our, our normally accepted liberties against those kind of constraints. And as I've said here, you know, the right to go to the pub. Um, some people have found that very hard to, 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 to accept that they can, can no longer do the things they took for granted in the past. So we've got this kind of new demobilization. And of course, I don't mean military demobilization, but I mean that we've, we've I think most fundamentally, we've come to realize that a lot of mobility is simply waste. We, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of resources, it's a waste of money, uh, it's, it's a waste of your life. You know, you, you're spending hours every day 
sat in a train or a bus or a car. It's just waste. And we, I think many people have begun to appreciate getting the time back, not apart from anything else, from working at home. Of course, there's been many issues. I'm not saying working at home is any kind of panacea. But what I am saying is that the pandemic has refocused our understanding of the benefits and the costs of mobility. Um, and so that means that, that we've also come to realize that we've kind of turned the equation on its head so that instead of mobility being a means to an end, it becomes the end to the means. It becomes the, 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 the most important thing to be doing simply because it props up the rest of the economy. Uh, and we've come to realize that perhaps that's not the right equation. So instead of linking transport policy with economic policy, we should, and perhaps we are beginning to start to link transport policy with health policy. Of course, for the car industry, actually this hasn't been all bad because the problems with the public transport sector and, and, and the unwillingness of individuals to risk that trip has meant that actually um, the, the ownership and use of a car has been quite, become quite a useful thing. And, and there the car is a defensive mechanism. It, it protects you, your individual and your family, your, your friends, you know, it protects you from the great unwashed out there, the, 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 the risky society that we live in. So I just want to capture a few of the kind of ups and downs of the politics of this. Um, and I've got a couple of kind of position statements from some leading protagonists on each side of the equation, but particularly I wanted to highlight uh, how that relates to the kind of socio-technical aspects. And, and so ASEA is the industry body that represents the automotive industry um, in the European Union and the wider Europe, in fact, uh, but they're mainly a lobbying entity to deal with Brussels. Um, and so they're very much concerned about the need to resist any significant change. And he's talking about concrete measures to avoid irreversible and fundamental damage. Now, this is interesting because, of course, the longer the time period extends, the more likely that is as an outcome. Um, and then the second side of that equation is, is the old argument that by reinvesting in the automotive industry and automobility, it will pull the rest of the economy forward. So this is very much privileging the economy over other issues and very much saying the, the automotive sector is a lead pillar in the, in, in the world economy and it will pull change forward. Similarly, this is the UK, uh, the SMMT is the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. It represents the UK industry, both manufacturing and retail. Um, so they're asking for this package of support um, to keep the industry going in the UK. Um, and they're again saying that, they're, that the future should be built on this platform of the automotive industry. Uh, on the other hand, we've got uh, Julia Poliskanova here. She's from a, a lobbying entity on the other side of this equation, t and &E, uh, who are basically interested in uh, environmental aspects of the automotive industry and improving sustainability performance. So she's in a slightly more ambiguous position. She's sort of saying, well, you know, we, we, we've got to keep people employed, but we must not let slip our current environmental targets for the industry. So this is a, a sort of slightly more balanced view. ASEA had been arguing for the dismantling of many of that kind of regulation, removing carbon targets, for example. They're saying, keep the targets, let's find our way through. And uh, even Boris Johnson, you know, arguing for this idea of recovering uh, health and fitness um, and very much putting that link, as I suggested, between health and mobility. Now, I've got a few other kind of sources talking about this. We've got the UK Citizens Assembly, interestingly, very much more assertive about what kind of changes should happen. Um, we've got the European Commission putting significant resources into new mobility packages and very much the active travel. This was something that's really come out from the pandemic, this massive support for active travel, still dwarfed by the road budget, still dwarfed by rail investment. You know, we're still building HS2. You know, these things are still going on, but at least there's a bigger slice of that pie for active travel. And, and there's a widespread support for that, a very deep support for that, um, as our mobility patterns have changed. So I think we've got quite a few lessons to, to come out of this. Um, 
I think one of the most important things is, is, is that certainly in, in socio-technical transitions work, and I think more generally, you know, in society and in our culture, we've had a very strong faith in the techn technological solution, uh, the magic silver bullet. The idea that we can invent our way out of a crisis. And, th and there's good reason for that. You know, we, in terms of the kind of technological progress that's been made over the last 200 years, it's, it's been astounding. And there are a great many achievements that one can point to that, that rest upon that, now, particularly in terms of the eradication of some diseases and significant improvements in, in for example, uh, supplying enough food for people in the world. We're still short, but it's not as bad as it was. So that, yeah, there have been significant changes from technology, but, and it's a massive but, what we've begun to realize is that behavior really, really matters behavior at an individual level and at a collective level. And, and it's amazing how much was achieved by behavioral change. In things like, let's say, carbon emissions. And I was just reading a report yesterday which said that um, 2020 carbon emissions globally will be down by about 7%, uh, mostly as a result of this pandemic. Now, that's not a lot. It's actually less. Um, in one year, then we need to achieve every single year up to 2030 if we're going to hit uh, the carbon reduction targets. But it is indicative that it can be done in the old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. And that depends on legitimacy. You know, the, 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 the idea that we all buy in to this uh, arrangement. I think uh, one, to me, one of the great examples of, of legitimacy is this idea of um, banning smoking in public places. It only really works if everybody enforces it. In other words, we can't rely upon you know, calling the police to tell, some, tell off somebody who's smoking in the wrong place. We collectively have to make it work. And the same depends on these behavior changes and uh, things like carbon emissions. If there's enough collective will, then things can things can happen, and and perhaps with that change of behaviour, more innovations, more changes in law and regulation can follow. You know, we can, for example, make it legal to ride electric scooters on the pavement or on the road or somewhere. Uh, we can make it illegal to park on pavements with cars. You know, we can do these things, and perhaps they become more possible because of what's happened with the pandemic. Um, but there's some big uncertainties. We don't know how long people will accept current restrictions or how long the behavior changes we've identified will stick. For example, how long are people going to stick with um, home delivery, home delivery of food, clothes, etc.? cetera? Um, we don't know. I think probably quite a few will, um, but we don't really know. Um, how long will people be prepared to Put aside their own economic interest. That's a much tougher one. Uh, there's a lot of strong interests out there who will be able to sway policy in all sorts of ways. Many of these interest groups provide significant funding to government, through taxation and so forth. So I think that's um, hard to call. And then even more difficult to call is, is how the specifics of the, of the pandemic have influenced other social issues. I mean, I, I've highlighted here the, the Black Lives Matter movement. In a way, I think part of the anger out of Black Lives Matter comes from the, the observation that certain groups in society are more vulnerable to the effects of this pandemic. And that's for many, many reasons. They're in more vulnerable occupations. They have uh, less access to healthcare poorer diets, many things, but you know, collectively there's a sense that the pandemic therefore has shone a light in there and it's provided the impetus for these kind of movements to emerge and, and to help drive change. Question is, how long will it stick? How hard can they push? What kind of changes will be uh, occurring as a result? Um, yeah, in terms of the, the kind of theoretical framing, and again, yeah, I think as academics, yeah, we have to think about these things. Um, I thought it was interesting that uh, although the socio-technical transitions is all about how societies change and how events can kind of come down from a higher level, hit a socio-technical system, trigger change, or how innovations can bubble up, changes in behavior can bubble up from the grassroots and, and trigger change. Despite all of that, uh, this idea of the pandemic didn't quite hit because mostly 
socio-technical transitions has worked within individual socio-technical systems, whereas the pandemic, of course, is affecting all of them differentially in different ways, but affecting all of them um, simultaneously. And so uh, I think the, the framework needs to be rethought somewhat. Um, I think the most likely outcomes in terms of my understanding and, and, and my area of research is that those kind of observable trends before are mostly accelerated by the pandemic situation. Uh, but some, I think, have really come from nowhere to become more, much more important. And, and most importantly, that is uh, this uh, idea of active travel uh, and the whole focus on the sustainable aspects of mobility. Um, I do worry that there will be uh, even greater bifurcation of wealth, uh, and that could have all sorts of implications for, for my work, but also for others. Um, you know, we're going to see that a lot of people in, in the um, on-demand economy uh, really, really suffered during this time period. Uh, many jobs have simply evaporated, many others uh, were decimated in terms of the revenues that individuals could earn and so on. And um, I think there may well be a backlash to that. It, it may well be uh, something that will change. But at the moment, at least, you know, I think it's, it's extremely worrying that someone like um, Jeff Bezos can, can actually gain several billion more dollars of income per week, whilst uh, vast numbers of society are, are suffering more and more than they ever were. So I think that's going to be an issue. Um, and then the, the acceleration of restructuring, uh, also in automotive, uh, other sectors as well. We've seen that, 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 that in a way, crisis always does that in, in economic terms. It exposes the vulnerable. Um, and when events turn against you and you haven't got the resources and you haven't got the, the uh, reserves, that's when change happens. And certainly automotive, that's, that's going on right now. Um, but I just want to end with a few thoughts about uh, academia. Um, and, and there's some similarities with climate change here. Because one of the issues that this, is, this whole pandemic has exposed, at least for me, has been that uh, the science has been very uncertain. And, and it's been changing, the advice has been changing, the analysis has been changing. Do people get infected by aerosol transmission? You know, can people get affected a second time? Can we be immunized? How long will it last? Yeah, you know, all these questions emerging. Um, and you know, I think there was a sense from society as a whole that there should be an answer. This is the answer. Uh, and, and that's a, a failure to really understand really what science is about, which is all really science is about discovering new answers all the time, maybe uh, taking away some of the previous answers and refuting some arguments, mm -hmm. developing new understandings, new insights and so on. Um, but it has at least thrown into the limelight the idea that, that science is important, that we should continue to have a strong scientific base. Um, uh, for all sorts of good reasons in society. Um, and I think that that's also applies to social science. You know, uh, we in the social sciences have a lot to contribute to this, partly because it's been so much wrapped up in things like behavior change, policy change, new regulatory frameworks, uh, new cultural changes, new practices, new social movements, uh, psychological burdens, uh, you know, many things are going on here where social sciences have a lot to contribute and it's in a sense our duty to contribute uh, within the context of this uh, crisis. Um, and yet, you know, at the same time, we are also grappling with these issues. You know, here I am talking to you via Zoom, wife in the kitchen having lunch, people in the hedge over there cutting their hedge, you know, it, it's all going on. Um, I'm not going to see my students until June, probably. Um, I'm gonna, my next class is going to be online. I'm wondering how my next research project is going to work. Um, we don't know. You know? And, and, and again, we are, are having to adjust and adapt and change. And, you know, a couple of years ago when I was running classes with my MBA students, I used to ask them, um, well, you know, let's think of a, a different kind of business model for, for the business school. Let, let, how about um, a purely virtual business school? And I'd ask them to go through that exercise as a kind of conceptual test of how they've understood business models and innovation. And uh, they would come up with all sorts of interesting things, but it's a very different world. And, um, you know, at the moment, we ourselves don't know where we're going. And I think there's the value in, in, in thinking about that as well. 
so um, I, I think I'd like to kind of st stop you there and uh, open it up for any questions and discussion. Thanks very much, Peter. That's really interesting to lots of things to think about there. Um, got a couple of questions, so I will try and address them in the order they've come in um, and we'll do our best to, to get through them. Uh, so the first one is, you mentioned non-traditional players entering the electric vehicle market. It's interesting that Dyson has pulled out of the market for developing electric vehicles. Do you have a view on why they have withdrawn? <laughs> I've never been much of a fan of Dyson, so uh, <laughs> that doesn't help my neutrality on this equation. Um, yeah, because I think to enter the industry and develop a mainstream car um, is very, very difficult still because uh, it's not just about the technology, it's about branding, it's about these economies of scale, distribution network, service network, and so on. If you look at Tesla, uh, it's taken them, what, 17 years about <laughs> to actually make a profit. And in the meantime, they have burned through billions of dollars. They have had huge resources behind them. Um, it is very different for a company like Dyson. They don't have that depth of resource. If they entered the market in a different way with different products, um, I think it'd be a different story. Uh, there are many interesting new entrants doing different sorts of things there, but where he was trying to come in, I think was a mistake. Thank you, that's great. Um, so the next question is, as mentioned, the market is moving towards shared connected autonomous vehicles. However, can this be possible within our current capitalistic system of growth? i.e. can a shared vehicle market continue to grow or do you see a need for degrowth? Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of degrowth. Um, and in fact, uh, in my recent studies on the shared vehicle market, I've been quite uh, critical because, uh, here's the thing, where you create those, the delivery of those kind of shared, shared uh, markets, when it's in a market setting, uh, then what you're doing is you're basically segmenting the market more finely. In other words, you're making it more possible for more people to achieve a certain sort of automobility. So what that means in, in, in ultimately is you're actually expanding the demand for automobility and the supply of automobility by the drivers who are prepared to provide those services or the companies providing the shared vehicles. So to me, um, sharing in that sense is, is not the answer. Uh, sharing in that sense simply increases the size of the pie. Um, whereas sharing in a degrowth world is much more uh, the answer in a, in a more collaborative, cooperative world uh, and a smaller scale world, then, then we have something to talk about. But right now, uh, I think I'd agree with the implied answer in the question that um, in a capitalist context, uh, vehicle sharing is not contributing a great deal, if anything, to more sustainable mobility. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next question says, describing the impact on the socio-technical system for Automon is helpful. As I understand it, you have suggested this is the case of behavioural change and collective will. Both behavioural shifts in smoking and recent non-driving followed significant pieces of legislation, i.e. anti-smoking legislation and pandemic restrictions. Most behaviour change literature would predict that without these regulatory forces, carbon emissions, number of car journeys, etc., will increase. Indeed, the evidence suggests that this has already occurred and colleagues in Kuala Lumpur tell me that the dreaded work jams are back and maybe worse than before. How can this socio-technical system approach add to this? Yeah, well, I think um, certainly the, the regulatory intervention is absolutely necessary because you need to create the structures with, which allow those behavioural changes to solidify, shall we say, or even be, become initiated in the first place. Um, and so you do, you do, I think it is important, therefore, that um, from a socio-technical system perspective, you understand the importance of all of the elements within the socio-technical system. It's not just about having the technologies or having businesses or whatever. It's about the totality of the system and, and how that works. Um, but I would go back to this point, you know, that uh, you know, having been in Brazil some time recently, you know, you see in Sao Paulo, people will spend two or more hours per day crawling 10 or 15 kilometers to get to work and back. They don't do that for fun. Uh, it's a structural imperative in a sense, and, and it's, it's getting to understand how we can unpack that, which, is, which will be at the key to really embedding those long-term changes. Of course, people got back in their cars and started driving because they still had their house there and their work there, and they needed to do something about joining the two up, and they didn't have the alternatives. We need to do more to, put your structures in place that allow those alternatives to come out. Thank you. Um, the next question says, given, oh, sorry, it's just popped up. 
There we go. Given strong co-alignment of mobility and the organization of cities, urban layout, density, work-life dynamics, etc. What are your thoughts on the future of our cities and planning? Well, you know, I think um, we have to be prepared to, to learn from elsewhere. I, I think that the, the risk is that we, we shot, shot throw our hands and oh, can't be done, uh, or people aren't going to do this, or there's, 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 there's no room for change. I think there is plenty of examples that there are plenty of room for change. Um, and we have to understand the interconnectedness of those changes. So um, for me, that means that we, uh, we have to really, really push on making it more difficult to do the things that we don't want and making it much easier to do the things that we do want. Uh, and, and in a simple way, it's about, for me, it's about localization of life. You know, that, that if you look at the, the, the kind of classic Danish examples like Copenhagen, you can see you can structure a city in a way that makes everyday mobility pretty easy uh, without needing a car. Um, and that's the first simple step. Uh, of course, urban fabrics can be really enduring. I mean, you know, the, in, in some cases, the shape of our cities goes back hundreds of years, but we can adapt those structures to different ways of, of, of uh, organizing our lives, different approaches to mobility and so forth. Um, and, and so I think a reversal of centralization of many activities, um, a willingness to close off and, and, and take away some mobility options and then foster others, also an important step. Um, bearing in mind, of course, that some people are not able to do active travel for all sorts of reasons, all sorts of reasons. but 25% uh, of households nearly in the UK do not have access to a car. So let's not get carried away that the, the, the car su supplies the mobility needs of, of uh, people in the UK because it simply doesn't. Thank you very much. Okay, um, next question says, do you believe the current political, economical narrative and systems need to change in order to push the socio-technical transition faster towards a more sustainable society? Isn't there the danger of people going back to normal once this pandemic is over under the current regime? Yes, well, of course, the first question is what is normal? I saw an interesting discussion on this um, where if you take obesity in the United States, for example, it is normal. Uh, so going back to normal doesn't necessarily mean going back to a good thing. <laughs> um, I think also that um, we, we can't just reverse time, you know, although I, I mentioned briefly life in the 1950s, we can't kind of go back to that. Um, but what you can have is, is, is some sort of aspirational goal. And, and this is where, you know, from a socio-technical systems perspective, this question of time, I think, is very important. That normally, uh, when people have looked in the past at these kind of socio-technical systems, they've changed really slowly. I mean, the, 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 the examples of, of the horse being replaced by the car, uh, this, this unfolds over a century. But well, we haven't got that long. <laughs> you know, we, we cannot afford for, uh, to wait for decades and decades to pass because uh, the pace of global climate change is, is, is staggering. You know, the, the pollution in our cities is unbelievable. Um, I was reading just yesterday how um, young people today, when I say young, I mean like you know, kids today, uh, are measurably less fit than kids of 20 years ago because they spend more time sitting around. And this is shocking. You know, this is a health crisis being kind of created for the future. So um, we absolutely need to focus on the pace of change. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and one of the things we've got to create, therefore, is these clear metrics where we are moving in a direction that we want to move at a rate at which we want to move. What are we going to use to measure those, those processes of improvement? I think that's where we're really struggling at the moment in, in the theory terms and empirical terms and in policy terms as well. How do we know we're going in the right way and how quickly we're going when we don't know what we can measure to show it? Mm. Okay, great. Thank you, Peter. The next question says, can you comment on the particular challenges of rural locations, poor public transport, less retail locally, etc.? Uh, yeah, there are some particular challenges, obviously. Um, I, I think there's, there's a, a bunch of issues in there. I, I mean, there are trade-offs for a start. Um, and no location, you ever watch those programs on TV, you know, location, 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 it's all about compromise, right? Uh, and so you trading off one thing against another. And historically, what we've done is we've traded off the advantage of urban living uh, against the, the perceived disadvantages of rural life. Um, I, I've done both. Uh, they both have their pros and cons. So 
I think the concerns I have about um, the lack of uh, mobile access and so forth in rural areas is, is much more around um, the, the, the kind of needs that people might have, for example, to access healthcare, to, to get good education, um, to get to high quality food and so forth. Increasingly, I don't think we have to worry about those things as much. Um, partly that's a technological solution with internet connectivity and so forth. Partly it's about the decentralization of things like power, which is going to get more and more. Um, so uh, that, that's going to help with all sorts of issues, uh, particularly around electric mobility. And partly it's going to be around sharing. And I think you know, in a more collaborative sharing system uh, with shared mobility, we can solve a lot of problems. Um, there is no panacea for, for those kind of issues, but um, I think perhaps they're a bit overstated. Um, and in many respects, uh, we, we did a study a few years ago looking at the electric vehicles in rural areas, and actually they're better suited <laughs> to those sort of settings than they are to urban areas um, for all sorts of interesting reasons. So um, I think there's a lot of scope for uh, improving the situation and the setting in those rural areas, and, and perhaps for even reversing uh, urbanization trends to create a more vibrant and, and viable uh, rural setting, which would help in foster those kind of resources that you need, you know, the, the small scale hospitals, the, 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 the local kind of facilities, the, the banks and dentists and God knows what else that, that you might want to access. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Peter. I think unless anyone has any more questions for Peter, um, I think we've probably come to the end of them, we have, which is almost perfect timing, so that's fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Peter. That was really, really interesting. Lots to think well, about. And lots yeah, pleasure. And, uh, thanks for everyone for, for trundling along. Um, it's nice to see you, even if I can't. Um, uh, perhaps one day soon we'll be able to do it for real. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, um, sorry, someone's just asked if it'd be possible to um, view the recording later. So yeah, absolutely. Um, aim to get it online within um, roughly a week uh, of, of today. So uh, I will do my very best. Um, but yeah, thank you very much again, Peter. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, our next webinar will be the 5th of November. Now we're skipping a week next week for half term. So please take a look at the programme and join us if you're interested. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.